First of all, thank you guys for being here, um, and uh, Jamie, PJ, Lars, and everyone that has to do with uh, setting this up. Um, I know uh, what a, a effect it's had on me in the last four years of attending here, so um, you know it, it means a lot that you guys are uh, up here listening to me, and hopefully you get something out of it. Um, I definitely don't take this privilege lightly being up here. So um, PJ asked me uh, to talk about this, uh, kind of stemming from a... Um, raising my hand and, and interjecting uh, about a year ago about uh, some sleep health uh, uh, topics and the importance of, um, of sleep in men's health. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a very large topic, so I'm gonna hopefully consolidate, kind of scratch the surface here on some things, maybe pique your interest in, uh, in exploring your, uh, your own sleep habits uh, and areas that we can uh, potentially improve there. So um, I have nothing uh, in terms of conflicts of interest to report here, just to uh, give a little background. So, uh, otolaryngology or ENT, uh, board certified uh, in that, uh, we have to uh, train in sleep surgery and, uh, and in sleep medicine, but, uh, but we're not sleep, uh, uh, board certified in sleep medicine is in terms of reading sleep studies and supplying uh, CPAP and things like that. So, uh, uh, meaning that I do some of the things that I'm going to be talking about in here, so I will make that very clear uh, when I get to those things, but uh, the goal is to kind of give you an overview and uh, unbiased, so I'm not trying to sell anybody CPAPs or anything here. Uh, and then, of course, please take this uh, not as for professional medical advice. Um, everything has to be kind of tailored to your own health uh, with your, yourself and your physician. So, um, so uh, what is sleep? Sleep is a really complicated behavior uh, to define uh, in the sense that, uh, that a lot of us kind of just take it for granted and, and go to sleep when we're tired, wake up when the alarm goes off and don't think much more uh, of it. Um, and uh, it's kind of uh, an odd thing when you think about it. If you're, if you're a physician when your kid was born, you know, your firstborn was, uh, you know, a couple hours old and they come up to you and they say, you know, hey, uh, Mr. Casey, your, your son is healthy. Your wife is doing great, but, uh, but your child's going to have this, this condition where they're going to uh, fall into a coma for about a third of their life. Uh, during which they're going to have these vivid hallucinations and they're going to be paralyzed for portions of that. Uh, you'd be like, well, what the heck is that? I don't want to sign up for that. Uh, but, but that's essentially what sleep is. And, uh, and so it's an odd concept, but there are real benefits uh, to it. Um, and uh, and is, this is one of the definitions, but there are many objective and subjective definitions of sleep that you can find uh, online. Uh, but basically it's uh, restoring the function of our bodies so that we can be more effective throughout the course of the day. Um, Sleep is, is absolutely critical. It's one of the three pillars of health. So diet, exercise, and sleep. And unfortunately, it's the one that tends to be taken for granted uh, and, uh, and, and skipped out on uh, for the sake of the others. Um, and uh, sleep debt is very common in industrialized countries uh, in effect of workaholism, bless you. Uh, and uh, uh, this constant uh, screen time with accessibility with 9 p.m. emails and group texts coming in at 10 o'clock at night. Um, and uh, worrying about kids' activities and, and just the, the pace of life right now, that sleep is, is often what we sacrifice the most at our, at our uh, detriment. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, the, the human circadian rhythm, it's approximately 24 hours, um, uh, slightly longer than that, and it's dictated uh, and programmed by uh, our genetics, uh, extrinsic factors like light, temperature, activity, and it's innately programmed. We can't ignore it or avoid it. So the more uh, sleep debt we fall into, uh, the, the less healthy we become. And so sleep debt is technically uh, defined as less than seven hours of sleep. Uh, the goal, as we'll see in a few slides from now, is seven to nine hours of sleep in the, uh, in the adult. Um, and more than a third of Americans are sleep deprived uh, and functioning on sleep debt. Uh, and unfortunately, naps on the weekend aren't enough to recover fully uh, from that. So the effects of sleep debt are both physical and mental. Uh, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, uh, reduced immune function, um, metabolic dysregulation, things like weight gain. Um, so if you're trying to lose weight, but you're not prioritizing your sleep, you're actually working against yourself uh, in doing so. Um, risk of accidents, uh, minor and major. Um, and then also mental health disorders like anxiety, depression, uh, dementia. Uh, people with an average of five hours of sleep actually increases the risk of dementia by over 30% uh, once you uh, reach age 50 and above. But some of the benefits of healthy sleep habits will uh, conversely boost your immune function, uh, memory consolidation, uh, improvements in, uh, in uh, sexual health, uh, as well, um, so there's actually a study that demonstrates that uh, that uh, women with an extra one hour of sleep 
uh, actually are 14% more likely to desire and engage in intimacy the following day. So uh, not just your sleep, but your spouse's sleep is, uh, is important as well. And, that, and the quality of that is improved. Um, erectile dysfunction is, is uh, commonly a side effect of sleep disorder. So uh, uh, it's not just a matter of low T, although the, the, uh, testosterone does have some influence on this. Uh, testosterone actually peaks uh, when you sleep. Um, unfortunately, if, uh, if you're getting poor sleep and you have plus you have low testosterone, uh, then uh, you replace the testosterone, um, that actually doesn't solve the problem. You're basically putting a Band-Aid on it and extra testosterone in your system can actually uh, lead to more sleep apnea symptoms. So you can actually worsen it by just trying to treat the, uh, the deficit without improving your sleep. Um, and then uh, in the, the reverse, sexual activity actually uh, affects sleep quality by the re release of uh, some anti-stress hormones. So the um, stages of the sleep cycle. So there's four stages. Um, you can break, break them down into uh, two uh, types, non-rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement. <coughs> Um, and so stage one and two are the lightest uh, stages of sleep. So that's when we're just starting to fall asleep. We're a little drowsy, but easily, uh, easily uh, uh, awakened. And then, so that's about 50% of the night. Stage three and four are gonna be the most restful stages of, uh, of sleep, um, as we'll see in the next couple of slides here. Um, over the course of the night, you spend more time in deep sleep in the first 50 to 60% of the night um, and then in the second uh, half or the last 40%, uh, you can see that you end up spending more time in, uh, in REM sleep uh, than you do in, in deep sleep. And so that's just demonstrating that a full night of sleep is important because uh, you'll actually fluctuate through being awake, uh, going into REM, light, deep sleep, and then cycling through here, and then you come out of the deep sleep and spend more time in that restful REM sleep. And so, uh, we'll skip the, the brain waves. This is basically just showing the, the significant difference in the brain activity um, throughout those, uh, those uh, <coughs> stages. And basically, uh, to summarize the importance uh, of breaking them down into two uh, steps, the non-REM sleep is basically the decluttering and REM is the organizing. So for example, if this is your garage, think of this as your brain taking in information throughout the course of the day. Um, and your brain is just absorbing everything. A funny video that you saw, maybe someone that you heard at men's fraternity work uh, uh, conversations, etc. And you're just piling in all that junk in your garage. When you fall asleep, that first part of the night, the non-REM sleep, that stage three uh, and early stage four sleep, uh, is the decluttering. So you're not going to start putting things into bins and organizing them until you get rid of the clutter. So that's the importance of the non-REM sleep. The REM sleep is then the fine tuning, the organizing. So both stages and, and a complete night of sleep are critical. Um, during the light sleep, some of the physiologic changes that happen, uh, your respiration starts to slow, slow down, your heart rate decreases and body temperature drops. And these are how some of these wearables that we'll talk about shortly um, are able to monitor um, our sleep. They're not perfect as we'll talk about, but they're, they're good at tracking general trends. Um, so your heart rate decreases, body temperature drops, um, and then you start to transition between those cycles. Then you get to deep sleep and blood pressure drops. At this time, you start to release things like growth hormones, and that helps with tissue growth and, rec and cell recovery. Um, and so that's where some of the, uh, the physical uh, changes are, are taking place. And then the brain is flushing waste and uh, showing longer, slower uh, brain waves at that time. Then in REM sleep, uh, your respiration actually increases, your heart rate increases, uh, your, um, uh, you start to get some vivid dreams, and then your body actually becomes immobilized. You're actually paralyzed. And, and in some of these sleep studies uh, where they have EMGs attached to you, you're, uh, you actually lose all uh, voluntary muscle tone. Uh, and that's a, one of the ways that we can tell when people are in uh, REM sleep. So melatonin um, is the most popular sleep supplement out there right now, um, and uh, its origin takes uh, place in this tiny little gland right here in the brain called the pineal gland. And basically it's responsible for the sleep onset but not sleep maintenance. So the analogy is that uh, it acts like the starter at the beginning of a race, but it doesn't run the race. So it, it doesn't help you with sleep maintenance throughout the night, but it does help you to fall asleep for the people that it's effective for. Um, naturally, it's released as the, the evening uh, comes along as uh, we're responsive to light. Uh, when it starts to get darker, and this is where artificial light comes into play, you want to start 
uh, uh, turning lights off earlier in the evening, trying to uh, reduce your exposure to things like blue light and, uh, and, uh, and screen time, uh, because melatonin production starts with reduction in light. And so uh, it peaks in the middle of the night and then starts to come down as you're waking up in the, uh, in the morning. Uh, it does trend toward decreasing production as we age, though. So this is where uh, some uh, age-induced insomnia. Um, this is also helpful to use in jet lag for helping with sleep onset if you're having difficulty falling asleep. Um, and so, as I said, it's about uh, a quarter of the population have used it. Usually works within an hour if it works. There is thought to be some uh, placebo effect to it, but almost 90% of people that use it feel that they sleep better. Important. Side note that it can have side effects and there are some medication interactions, so it's not completely benign. Um, so just make sure that if you are on other medications that you just talk about it with your physician before you uh, take it. Um, and so um, on the same note, uh, this is why melatonin release is actually why you hear about blue light blocking glasses, uh, getting rid of the screens <coughs> from the bedroom, that sort of thing, not watching TV to fall asleep if you can help it. Um, because uh, our screens are, um, are, are, have a lot of blue light uh, spectrum, and so that actually inhibits melatonin production and can keep a person awake. So if you're able to, let's say you're reading at night or uh, you, know, you, have, uh, you can get uh, more red or, or kind of um, a sunlight color um, light bulbs in your, in your bedroom, that can really help you to um, start falling asleep sooner. Um, so, um, in, in, in talking about the circadian rhythm, this is kind of a busy slide, but I'm going to just try to make uh, three sense of it here. Our circadian rhythm is pre-programmed. So we're this, our wake drive uh, starts in the morning and we start to decline as, uh, as the evening comes along. While we're awake, our brains are releasing a, a, a protein called adenosine, which is uh, what helps to drive us to want to fall asleep. And so when our circadian rhythm starts to drop and our adenosine is, a, a, is at a high point, that's when we have the strongest pressure to fall asleep, when we're exhausted. And so uh, the reason that I, I show this is that that is where, that's how caffeine comes into play. So caffeine doesn't necessarily give you more energy. What it does is it actually competes with adenosine in your brain. So it blocks the effect. Meanwhile, you're, the longer you're awake, you're still building up more adenosine uh, but it's uh, but the caffeine is blocking the effect of that, so it, it decreases that drive to fall asleep. Uh, unfortunately, it uh, at some point that caffeine wears off five six hours or so, and then you can get that crash, uh, and uh, because you're, you've now uh, accumulated so much adenosine that you've been blocking, but it's still there. The caffeine wears off, and that's that afternoon crash some people will get. Um, there's some suggestion that if you can uh, get to the caffeine maybe a little bit later in the morning toward the peak of you know, your alertness and wait until then to start uh, drinking the caffeine that you may uh, be able to um, uh, have a, a better uh, afternoon in terms of your energy levels. Uh, but you don't want to drink it too late uh, because that will actually keep you up at night. So really ideally no, no more caffeine after Two, uh, two o'clock, some people say 12, usually um, most suggest about two o'clock, so you can actually get back to sleep. Too much caffeine also uh, re re in increases uh, adrenaline, so that's where you, you, you drink and then you're, you're getting jittery, uh, so that's the uh, effect of too much caffeine. Um, recommended hours of sleep. It decreases as we age, but never really goes below seven. So, uh, so infants obviously need quite a bit of sleep and that's uh, throughout uh, the, the day, seven straight hours of sleep ideally for, for adults. And, and questions to ask yourself whether or not you're getting enough sleep is, could you fall back asleep at easily at 10 or 11 in the morning? Uh, do you need that caffeine uh, in, uh, before noon to be able to function? Uh, if you didn't set an alarm, would you sleep past that time um, that you usually wake up. Um, if, if so, if you're waking up groggy, uh, you probably need more sleep or better sleep. Um, and, uh, and then also, are you having trouble focusing and concentrating at, at work? So insomnia, um, getting into some of these sleep disturbances, insomnia is 35% uh, of the population and another 5% or so uh, that are affected by other mental health disorders that cause insomnia. So um, it's the most common sleep disorder uh, in the US. Uh, people have difficulty with sleep onset, sleep maintenance, and some people combined uh, types. Technically, the true definition of insomnia is, uh, is the difficulty uh, with falling asleep and, and disturbances of sleep um, without 
other diagnoses that affect, are affecting it, anxiety, depression, medications that are affecting it. Um, and uh, and there's, there's different types um, based on the duration of time. There's transient insomnia, which is short term. That's where uh, a lot of us have experienced, you know, stress, stressing about work or something uh, with our kids. Um, that that uh, is something that most people will feel at some point during the course of the year. Acute insomnia is less than three months. There might be a big life event that is disrupting our sleep pattern. Um, but chronic insomnia is where it's, um, it's, it's lasted longer than three months. Um, and that's when, uh, the, if you haven't sought uh, any help with acute insomnia, uh, what, if you make it to three months and you're still struggling, that's really when uh, it's time to, to seek uh, some more help with that. Um, a lot of things can cause it. These are just some of them, you know, the, the, as we mentioned before, stress, lifestyle, uh, physical pain, uh, difficulty sleeping because you can't get comfortable in bed. Um, it increases uh, with age. Um, and it's very important. Uh, so a lot of times we're, we throw around the, the word insomnia um, for uh, when we're not giving ourselves enough opportunity to sleep. But the important difference between sleep deprivation and insomnia is that sleep deprivation is having the adequate ability but giving, some, uh, giving yourself an inadequate opportunity to sleep, not prioritizing the sleep. <laughs> insomnia is the reverse of that, having inadequate ability while having enough opportunity for that. Um, so some tips to prevent insomnia. So um, avoid taking naps. Uh, now, if you, um, uh, if you are sleep deprived, uh, naps can help with catching up on sleep uh, and that sleep debt. But if you suffer from insomnia, um, late naps could be a problem. So try not to take longer uh, than 30 minute naps. Try not to take naps in the uh, mid to late afternoon. Um, alcohol, caffeine, and tobacco, as mentioned, try not to drink caffeine later in the afternoon. Um, alcohol and, and tobacco uh, can affect the quality of sleep. So you might get the same duration of sleep, but it will affect the quality and the amount of time that you spend in that REM sleep. Um, Try not to eat too late. Um, a full stomach and digesting heavy, uh, heavy foods uh, can be really disruptive uh, to uh, getting a comfortable night of sleep. Again, screen time mentioned. Um, exercise um, has a pr profound effect on, uh, on, on our, our sleep as well. Um, and then also using your bedroom and mattress for sleep and sex only, as they recommend here. Uh, really trying not to uh, you know, do, uh, do work in bed, uh, trying not to associate other things that, that cause you stress in bed because uh, so spatial awareness uh, and spatial memory. If you're in bed and you're answering work emails and, and that sort of thing, when you're in bed, you're going to be taking the stress to bed. So really trying to keep bed and sleep uh, sacred. Um, and then making sure to address medical or uh, mental health causes of other broken up uh, sleep patterns. So uh, uh, BPH, you know, prostate issues, nocturia, or getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Interestingly, those are pretty obvious reasons why we might get poor sleep. But there actually are studies that demonstrate that uh, people that are, are getting poor sleep are more likely to have those issues. Um, and, uh, and so some of the, the suggested uh, mechanisms as to why that happens is that uh, as we spend more time in, in light sleep, we're not getting quality sleep, um, that we become more aware and easily awakened to ha then have to go to the bathroom. And so, uh, of course, there are uh, organic reasons why we might have to go to the bathroom more frequently, but the disrupted sleep will also compound that, uh, that issue. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is a type of therapy that's really uh, the most successful initial treatment for insomnia. Um, sleep aids are good in some cases. Again, uh, talk to your uh, medical provider because there are significant risks that are often ignored. Um, and so this, uh, this study that's referenced here talked about long-term or frequent use of uh, things like Ambien um, actually have an increased risk of mortality, wow. cancer, and dementia. Um, and, and one study demonstrated over a two and a half year uh, uh, window that people that use uh, things like Ambien for more than half of the nights of the year uh, had a 5x uh, risk of mortality in that two and a half year span. And some of them uh, make sense, fatal accidents, falls at night, um, but some things like uh, increased risk of infection as well, which they have not been able to uh, necessarily explain that, uh, uh, that, that causation there. Um, other things like acupuncture, yoga, hypnosis, aromatherapy are, are helpful with that. Um, 
So this gets more into some of the things that, that, that I, I do um, uh, treat and some of the procedures and things that, that I do do just for, for clarification there. Um, but so sleep studies, again, uh, I'll, I'll, di or I'll pr prescribe sleep studies. I don't uh, read them or, or uh, prescribe CPAP from them, but there's multiple different kinds based on what we're looking uh, at. The, the best is the in-lab level one sleep study where you have uh, an attendant, it's a, it's a, it's a attended uh, sleep study, so if there's any, uh, you're on video, audio recording, um, and if there's any issues or confounding uh, data that's coming through, it can actually be adjusted. Um, and so there's, uh, there's EEGs measuring your brain waves, as I showed before, in the different stages of sleep. EKG that's looking at your heart rates and your heart rhythm. Uh, an EMG, which is looking at movements um, and, uh, and a, Ideal level one sleep study also has EMG in your legs so for sort of things like restless leg syndrome that can keep people awake. Um, electrooculography, which is looking at the rapid eye movements we talked about. Breathing sensors and res uh, respirometers, um, and then uh, pulse ox, et cetera. So that's basically uh, the gold standard to which we compare all of our Apple watches and the aura rings and all those sorts of things. Um, so that's next slide, speaking of, so Apple Watch, or a, a Whoop, Fitbit, Garmin, what, what have you, there's a lot of these wearables that are very popular and for good reason. They measure uh, kind of surrogate measurements for our sleep. Now, they obviously aren't going to be measuring uh, your uh, respirations on your wrist necessarily. They're not going to be looking at uh, the uh, EMGs or, or the uh, brain rate waves, but they look at things like movement, heart rate, motion, blood oxygen, heart rate variability, temperature, which, uh, which um, somewhat reliably can track your sleep. Uh, this was actually my sleep a couple nights ago. Uh, I went to bed nice and early, but it gives you kind of a report and, uh, and it shows you the stages of sleep, getting into deep sleep, light sleep, REM sleep. Um, and so it, it's good for tracking your sleep. Uh, it's, it's good for uh, helping people to uh, stay cognizant of their, their habits, um, but it's not the same uh, accuracy as a sleep study. So if you are wearing one of these things and you are getting poor sleep, um, or if, if, it, if this is identifying a significant trend in poor sleep, definitely important to go to see a medical provider for that, because these are not diagnostic, but helpful for just general tracking. One thing that's interesting too, this is a Fitbit. Um, there's some apps like Sleep Cycle that you can download. Um, and what they basically do is they, they try to um, track your, uh, some of your uh, vitals to wake you up in a window of time uh, where you're gonna be the least tired. So they try not to wake you up when you're in REM sleep so that when you wake up, it's a little bit more, uh, you're, you're a little bit more awake and alert. Ideally, you wanna try to wake up when you're not in the middle of REM or stage three, you wake up more groggy. So there are some of these wearables that uh, I think that's one of the most helpful things um, uh, that I've experienced using. Um, so here's an example of comparing uh, just one of those examples, the Aura Ring and uh, a polysomnogram, an in-lab sleep study. And you can see the general trends are fairly accurate. It's not perfect, you have little you know, breakups in some of the REM sleep recordings. Um, over here, the, uh, the Aura Ring measured one solid uh, REM sleep stage where it really wasn't REM the whole time. But for the most part, the patterns are, are, are somewhat consistent enough to be able to, to monitor yourself. Um, so snoring, um, this is, I, I have this talk daily in my practice. Snoring and sleep apnea are related but separate things and with different risk factors uh, associated with them. Snoring is a noise that we make and it comes from turbulent airflow from some obstruction in the upper airway. Um, sleep apnea is when that, that vibration or that narrowing actually becomes blockage or obstruction. Now one common uh, um, uh, misunderstanding with this is that um, snoring can come from nasal airway. Um, but it, but apneas are not coming from the from the nose. So there's a a, a lot of advertisements and, and uh, um, kind of misconceptions that uh, nasal surgery is it, it can improve sleep apnea scores. It's not necessarily the case. It can decrease uh, snoring, but it does not um, uh, it doesn't affect your sleep apnea scores um, because the actual location of the obstruction is down here in the throat most common is soft palate, tongue base, and then uh, the, the uh, tonsils can certainly as well. Um, sleep apnea affects, uh, it's always a wide range in every study you look at, but it's thought to be an average of about 22 to 25% of the population, um, higher in, in, uh, in men, um, and then uh, um, symptoms that you, you may notice. 
Uh, you may be told by your spouse that you're holding your breath uh, or that you're gasping for air, the kind of classic <coughs> that kind of sound is what uh, they might hear and that is usually an apnea spell that you're coming out of. Uh, excessive fatigue, brain fog, um, headaches, especially morning headaches, mental errors, cognitive impairment, unrestful sleep, gasping, decreased, uh, decreased libido. Diagnosis has to be through a sleep study. Um, the risk of sleep apnea, um, snoring. I remember the Indian guides back in the day, uh, the loudest snore was like the most manly dad, right? But, but so it was always kind of a joke, you know, when people would snore, but, but really uh, now we're realizing what it, uh, effect it has on, on, our, on our bodies. Cardiovascular disease is higher, stroke risk is higher, anxiety and depression, um, increased risk when you're going in for surgery, erectile dysfunction going back to that. Um, uh, and then uh, risk factors, uh, excessive weight, older age, narrow airway, uh, male gender, family history. Treatment, uh, first line, weight loss, positional sleeping, more on your side than on your back uh, for most people, uh, helps to improve your sleep. Uh, but then positive airway pressure like CPAP, there are certain devices you can use and then surgery when indicated. Uh, briefly, when we um, test people for sleep apnea, we look at these scores. The main score, when you look at a busy sleep uh, study, uh, the, the, the main thing to look at is the AHI score. That's the apnea hypopnea index. The apnea hypopnea, an apnea is when you either stop breathing for 10 seconds or more, or at least reduce your airflow by 90%. Okay, so you have an associated uh, drop in your oxygen uh, because you're not passing air. Apnea is without breathing. Hypopnea, under breathing. Reduction in your airflow by at least 30% with a 3 to 4% drop in your oxygen. Okay, so uh, apneas and hypopneas are essentially thought, uh, scored similarly, so they're compiled into one index. Per hour, how many times per hour are you obstructing? Are you not getting enough air? What happens when your body realizes you're not getting enough air? You get a rush of adrenaline, your heart rate increases, you go to a lighter stage of sleep because you're trying to get muscle tone back into your throat so that you can pass that air and get it into your body. And uh, that disrupts your sleep quality. That, uh, the, those constant rushes of adrenaline are not good for your heart and your blood pressure. And so uh, very important to, uh, to know if you, uh, if you have this because it can have a, a number of effects on your body. Under 15 episodes an hour is mild sleep apnea. Under five episodes an hour is considered normal. Mild uh, sleep apnea is associated with, uh, with, uh, with fatigue, uh, with sometimes headaches, confusion, but not necessarily all, a lot of the cardiovascular and stroke risks that we see in moderate to severe. But let's say someone has moderate sleep apnea and they're uh, obstructing 15 times an hour. That's once every four minutes. Severe sleep apnea, uh, 30 times an hour, uh, that's once every, every two minutes, essentially. And we'll see people that have uh, scores upwards of 100. Wow. And so imagine 60 minutes an hour and they have scores upwards of 100. Uh, they're not really breathing. Yeah. Um, and some of those patients will say that they're more tired when they wake up than they were when they went to bed because they're actually struggling to breathe mm -hmm. and their bodies are working harder when they're sleeping than when they're awake. Uh, and that's dangerous. So, oh, I think we froze. Oh, um, I don't know if we have time for this. I'm going to skip it. It's a video of, of showing obstruction. It's a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. So CPAP first line. Um, it's a gold standard to which we compare all the other, um, all of the other uh, uh, methods to treat sleep apnea. Uh, least invasive. It's non-surgical. There's different variations that you can use to make it more comfortable. And there's a number of different masks that you can wear. The nasal pillow type are the most tolerated. So if you've ever tried it, didn't like it because you had a full face mask, the nasal pillows are typically... Uh, the most uh, the most effective or tolerated the cons cumbersome not sexy need to clean it regularly um, and tolerance can be limited if you have nasal obstruction um, oral appliances uh, these are becoming more popular uh, basically what these do is they uh, they, they work like uh, basically like sports mouthpieces, but they uh, pull the jaw forward so that rather than narrowing your airway here, it actually pulls the jaw and thereby the connected soft tissue forward so that you can, uh, that you can breathe. Um, they're adjustable, they're silent, there's no hose or machine. It's only really uh, indicated for mild to moderate sleep apnea. So if you have severe sleep apnea, uh, unless you're using it to decrease the pressure of your CPAP machine, it's not an ideal uh, isolated treatment. Um, downsides, they can be uncomfortable, they can shift your teeth uh, if you really have to have it um, jacked up uh, to, to help you. Um, and they can exacerbate TMJ, pain and dysfunction, uh, jaw clicking and things like that. 
Um, if you have tried CPAP and not tolerated it, uh, as long as it's documented appropriately, insurance does typically cover it. Um, so yeah, talk to your, your provider about making sure the documentation, documentation is accurate there. Um, Inspire implants, this is the new, uh, one of the new uh, therapies. Uh, so Inspire implant is for people that have tried CPAP and failed. Uh, moderate to severe sleep apnea only, um, certain BMI requirements, um, and then you have to do a, a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. So basically, if you make, uh, meet all the criteria, we have to take you to the operating room, put you to sleep, take a look at your airway, and make sure that the pattern of collapse is, is appropriate for this. But essentially what this is is a device that we make an incision here and here in the chest, and, uh, and we find the, the uh, nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, which controls tongue movement. We isolate, uh, basically, in that nerve, uh, you have branches that pull the tongue uh, in and pull the tongue out. Uh, obviously, you don't want to uh, isolate the ones that pull the tongue inward because that'll cause you to obstruct more. So we find the nerve that, uh, the nerves that pull the tongue forward. Once we isolate that, we put a little cuff around that nerve and then we tunnel a wire through underneath the skin to the second incision that we make where there's a small little pacemaker-like device that's there. Um, and the lead, this is the old way, but the lead now goes in between the second and the third uh, rib and senses when you breathe. So when you go to sleep, you take this little garage door opener looking thing, we put it on your chest, you turn it on, and it waits whatever you set it, 30, 40 minutes, so you think you're gonna fall asleep. And every time then you breathe or inspire, <coughs> your tongue actually moves forward and your soft palate with it. So it, it, instead of falling back and blocking your airway, it actually keeps your airway open. Um, and then after six or seven hours, again, whatever you set it at, it, uh, it turns off on its own or you just grab the remote and you turn it off uh, if you wake up early. Um, we don't have a lot of time for this, so these are other types of very less common uh, surgeries now that are done for that. Um, mouth taping, controversial. I know some people swear by it. It's one of those things like uh, Q-tips. We recommend against it, uh, but, uh, but, but uh, there are uh, some benefits. People feel uh, that they breathe uh, uh, better uh, when they're, they're breathing through their nose. There's certainly better filtration. However, it can be dangerous because if you have sleep apnea and you're struggling to breathe, uh, the last thing you want to do is obstruct your breathing. So uh, I would not recommend it for sleep apnea. In general, try to stay away from it if you can. Uh, and there's a lot of advertisements, micropaps and things nowadays that are advertised but not uh, truly helpful. Uh, we're getting to the end here. So balloon dilation uh, is something uh, that is advertised often for uh, curing sleep apnea. Uh, it's good for sinusitis. It does not work for sleep apnea. I can just leave that there. Um, but uh, uh, the sinuses have no effect on airflow um, through the nose and, and has no effect on sleep apnea. So um, uh, nasal surgery can be useful if you're not tolerating CPAP machines because uh, you can't breathe through the nose. So things like septoplasties and, and tricking down these guys called turbinates so that you have more airflow through the nose can be helpful for CPAP intolerance. So if your CPAP use is limited by nasal airflow, that is where nasal surgery can help, but it does not reduce that AHI number that I talked about. Um, lastly, uh, and just kind of briefly gonna go through this. Um, there's a lot of foods and supplements and things that are uh, hypothesized to have effect on sleep. Um, these are some foods that, um, uh, that have variable effects on, on sleep. Vitamin D, melatonin are helpful and are um, high in most of these here. Um, these are other things that uh, have been uh, kind of um, uh, theorized that may have some benefit. Again, we talked about melatonin. Lavender scents can be helpful to reduce anxiety, help to fall asleep. And a lot of the other ones don't have a lot of research on them, so I'm not recommending them. Uh, I'm just recommending that, you know, make sure you're doing your own research if you're gonna take any of those. Uh, last slide, ambient and benzodiazepines, um, hangover effect, daytime fatigue, fall, dry mouth. Those are better for short term, uh, helping to fall asleep uh, while improving sleep habits and seeking help, but not for long term use. Nicotine, associated with fewer hours of sleep, poorer quality and increased wake ups, um, and can actually increase uh, nightmares and headaches. <clears throat> Cannabis is a big one. There's not a lot of research right now, but it's becoming more popular for certain things like people suffering from chronic pain, PTSD, and multiple sclerosis. Uh, it can increase that sleep drive, that adenosine we talked about earlier, um, and has variable effects on patients, and uh, short-term use could be helpful, but again, we're still uh, waiting on more uh, data on that. Um, 
Ideal temperature for sleep, 60 to, uh, it's pretty cold, 60 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and lastly is alcohol. Just be careful drinking alcohol right before uh, bed. It has a negative effect on sleep, sleep quality, decreases REM in the first part of sleep, causes more increased wake-ups uh, and more fatigue the following day. I'm sorry. It's a big topic, <laughs> barely scratching the surface. I don't know, I, I tried so hard. It, it, was, it was like 15 slides longer, so, uh, but uh, thank you.